Okay, we're going to get started now with a couple of invited talks. And first of all, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Yunshun Chen. Uh, Yunshun works uh, in Melbourne at the Weihai. Uh, and today we'll be talking about a, one of the most well known bioconductor packages for which uh, he's a key developer on uh, the Edge R package. Uh, over to you, Yunshun. All right. Um, thanks, Pete, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Yunshun Chen. And um, first, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to speak here today. And also, thank you all for tuning in. As you can see from the title, uh, I'm going to talk about the Edge package, um, which I believe some of you might have used for your daily iron seek analysis. So, uh, so in today's talk, I'm just going to give you an overview of the current state of the Edge package. Okay, so I first give you a brief introduction to iron seek differential expression analysis using Edge followed by some other functionalities offered in Edge R. And at the end, uh, I'll also mention some of its application uh, to single cell data analysis. All right, um, the name of the Edge R package stands for Empirical Analysis of Digital Gene Expression in R. So as the name suggests, it was designed for analyzing digital data which are in the format of integer counts. Now, back in 2008, uh, when Edge was still under development, RNSeq had not yet become popular. And microarray was still, uh, was still the dominating gene expression technology. So for digital data, uh, one of the commonly used platform back in the day was Sage, uh, which quantify uh, sequencing tags of cross samples. So, the original uh, purpose of Edge R was to analyze Sage data where the features are sequencing tags. And this is also the historical reason that uh, we use uh, tags in some of the Edge R functions, such as top tags, estimate tag wise disk. And now, since 2008, um, the Edge R, uh, sorry, the Iron Seek technology has quickly gained its popularity in the field. Um, so Edge R was, uh, was then adapted to analyze RNC data. All right, as you know, in an RNC experiment, you will start with a bunch of cDNA from RNA samples. We then chop them into pieces and map them back to a genome and finally quantify the read counts for each gene. So the final output of RNC data is a count matrix as shown in this example here. And Edge R was designed to solve uh, the most fundamental bioinformatics problem in the RNC experiment, that is to detect and interpret differences in the abundance of genes or other genomic features between experimental conditions, cell type, or disease state. So in this example here, we wanted to compare the white type mice with a uh, mute mice. All right, a typical RNA-seq data will normally have two sources of variation. So first, uh, there's a biological variation between the replicates, which assume is gamma distributed. And also there's technical variation due to sequencing error, which follows the Poisson law. So altogether, it implies that the observed recounts follow negative binomial distribution and Edge R was one of the first packages that introduced the negative binomial distribution to account for the two sources of variation in RNC data. Um, the RNCD analysis may look pretty straightforward nowadays, um, but back in the day, there was no method even for a simple two group paired comparison like this. So as you can see, um, there were several challenges for RNC D analysis back in the day. Um, first of all, uh, we needed to estimate the variation between the replicates, which is a dispersion parameter. And that was done by spline interpolation in Edge R. 
Then we needed to handle our complex experimental design. And that was achieved by fitting negative binomial generalized mean model together with Cox Reed adjusted profile likelihood in order to obtain unbiased dispersion estimates. And finally, we need to deal with the fact that many RNC experiments only have a small number of samples, which means we don't have much degrees of freedom for estimating gene-wise dispersion. And the problem was solved by adopting an empirical-based information borrowing strategy. And this is why we have the word empirical as part of the name of the agile package. All right, over the last decade, we have made a lot of improvements to the agile pipeline. So the classic, uh, the classic approach was first implemented in the original agile, and it was designed for simple two group comparisons. So we hardly use the classic approach anymore these days. Compared to the classic agile, the GLM approach is more flexible and hence has been widely used nowadays. So in a standard agile pipeline, given a count matrix, we first create a DG list object, followed by gene filtering and normalization. And then we estimate the dispersion using estimate disk function. And after that, you can either fit a negative binomial generalized linear model using GLM fit, followed by likelihood ratio test, or you can fit a quasi model followed by quasi likelihood F test. The quasi likelihood F test provides better FDR control. Hence, this is the most recommended pipeline in, um, in Agile. Okay, another thing I wanted to mention here, um, which is also very common in RNC-D analysis is about um, applying a full change cutoff to the list of DE genes. So we have seen this in many published studies uh, where people simply subset their list of DE genes based on the full change cutoff. So I wanted to emphasize a point here that this kind of approach is very ad hoc and could violate the FDR that was controlled by the agile pipeline. So here I'm showing you some MA plots from a simulation study where we know the true and false positives. So all the colored dots here, both blue and red, are those detected as DE genes under the 0.05 FDR using the agile quasi like the pipeline. As we can see, if there is no cutoff, the, the actual false discovery rate is well under controlled. Now, if we impose a log to full chain cutoff of two, then you can see that the actual false discovery has increased to about 25%. And it goes up even higher if you increase the threshold to 2.5. So clearly adding an ad hoc full chain threshold is not a good practice. Um, a rigorous statistical testing strategy is required um, for a differential expression relative to a full change threshold. So in EJA, this can be done uh, by using the GLM treat function. And here I'm showing you the MD plots of an RNC data. We can see that there are thousands of the genes without any full change threshold. And after applying a GLM treat function with a full change threshold of 1.5, um, we were able to focus on genes with larger differences between the groups while still controlling the false discovery rate. And as you can see that the GLM treat function uh, performs rigorous tests for DE relative to a full change threshold for each gene, rather than using a uniform full change cutoff for all the genes. Um, but please bear in mind that the GLM treat uh, is often used when there are too many DE genes and you wanted to focus on DE genes that are more biologically relevant. If there are not many DE genes to start with, uh, then there will be no need to test against a full change threshold. Um, and as for the choice of the full change threshold, it should be set to a low value. And it is better to, um, to interpret this, the threshold as 
the code change below which we are definitely not interested in the gene, rather than the flow change above which we are interested in the gene. Okay, so that's for RNA-seq gene level D analysis in HR. And now I will give you a brief overview of other functionalities offered in HR. So firstly, HR can be used for performing gene set enrichment analysis. So basically, HR computes Z-score equivalents of negative binomial random deviates for each observed recount. And then it utilizes the downstream gene set testing functionalities implemented in Lima. And in particular, um, it uses Rose, Camera, and Fry for standard gene set tests, and Goana for gene ontology analysis, and Kega for CAG pathway analysis. It's very easy to use. Um, the Z score computation is automatically performed when calling the gene set testing functions in HR. As you can see in this example here, we first perform a quasi lightweight app test, and then we can run Gawana directly on the output from the, uh, from the app test. Then, and, and the gene set test result can also be visualized using buckle plot as we normally do in Lima. HR can also be used for RNC time course analysis. Um, in some studies, people may be interested in identifying genes uh, that correlate with time points. So here is an example of a Drosophila RNC study on 12 successive embryonic developmental stages. So this is the MDS plot where uh, the 12 samples are labeled according to the number of hours since, for, uh, since virtualization, uh, the MDS plot shows a smooth trend of transition in gene expression during embryonic development from start all the way up to 24 hours. So assuming gene expression changes smoothly over time, uh, we can then use a qubit spline curve uh, with a certain number of degrees of freedom to model the gene expression along the time. And here we can incorporate um, the spline curve into a design matrix and then proceed to a standard edge of pipeline. And by doing so, uh, we were able to identify genes that are strongly associated with time points. For example, these two genes are among the top list of significant genes. All right, alternative splicing is another area of interest in RNA-seq experiments. And HR can detect uh, potential splicing events by testing for differential axon usage. And this is done by deep splice DGE function in HR. So basically, it tests for differences between the axons log full change and the overall log full change uh, for the gene where those axons belong. Uh, here, I'm showing you a diagram for for a gene with four axons. And in this diagram here, you can see that this gene is differentially expressed between the two groups. So are all the four axons within the gene. Uh, and you can also see that log full changes are consistent across all the, all the axons. So there's no differential splicing events between the groups, even though uh, the gene and all the axons are differentially expressed. Whereas on the right, we can see that exon two is highly used in group two compared to group one, um, suggesting a, a differential splicing event within this gene. Um, the deep splice results can be visualized um, by plotting the log full changes of each exon versus the average of all the exons as shown on the right. So this is a deep splice analysis of the real RNA-seq data. And these are the top genes uh, that are detected as differentially spliced. Okay, I've talked about gene level D analysis in HR. Now with some modifications, um, HR can also be applied to transcript level D analysis. The main challenge of transcript level analysis is to account 
for the compatibility of RNA sequencing reads across different transcripts. So a read um, that can be unambiguously mapped to a gene would have a certain chance to be, to be assigned to one of the overlapping transcripts originated from that gene. For example, suppose these are the two transcripts for a particular gene, and here we have those reads. And of course, these two reads will be mapped to transcript one for sure, whereas those four reads would have a certain chance to be mapped to, to, uh, to be assigned to either transcript one or transcript two. So this quantification uncertainty for transcripts uh, increases technical variability. And to address this issue, uh, we use the bootstrapping strategy uh, offered in Salmon and Callisto to estimate this additional technical variability, which we refer to as over dispersion. So here we first obtain transcript expression profiles by running Salmon or Callisto with bootstrap. Then we fit an over dispersed Poisson model to the bootstrap counts um, to obtain the over dispersion estimates. And this is implemented in the catch salmon and catch callisto functions in HR. And finally, we can remove this over dispersion uh, by scaling the counts based on dispersion estimates. And here I'm showing you the BCV plots of the transcript level count data before and after the over dispersions are removed. Uh, we can see that uh, the count scaling approach removes some extra technical variability. And after transcript counts are scaled, we can then proceed to a standard HRD analysis pipeline. All right, finally, I will talk about some of the uh, HR applications to single cell analysis. So one of the important steps of a single cell on the seq analysis is to find marker genes for cell clusters. And this is often done by uh, performing differential expression analysis uh, between clusters of cells. Mm, there are many methods uh, specifically designed for single cell on the seq D analysis. Uh, but sometimes people also use bulk on the seq D methods such as um, HR um, for D analysis at a single cell level. Um, it is an option, but, um, but it is not recommended in general. Uh, this is because uh, if you do that, then cells are treated as replicates, but they are actually not. And also bulk methods make stronger assumptions about the data, uh, which is more likely to be violated for individual cells in single cell RNA-seq. However, in the case of multi-sample single-cell RNA-seq analysis, uh, single-cell RNA-seq experiments, um, the DA analysis will be, will be slightly different. And uh, this is because um, some extra cares are, are required to account for the biological variation between the samples. And this can be achieved by constructing pseudo-bulk uh, samples followed by standard HRD analysis pipeline. So the pseudo samples are created by aggregating the expression profiles of the cells from the same sample and within the same cluster. So here is an example from a human breast tissue single cell RNA atlas. We identify seven cell clusters from 11 human patients. So we created about 70 pseudo samples as shown in the MDS plot on the right. Then the downstream D analysis can be performed using the standard edge on pipeline. And this approach will correctly take into account the biological variation between the samples. Okay, so uh, I've mentioned to you earlier about um, performing time course analysis in uh, edge up. And this strategy can also be applied to single cell RNA-seq data. So here is an example of, um, of the single cell RNA atlas of, of mouse memory gland. And one of the aims of the study is to um, 
to explore the early developmental stages of the mammary gland from embryo to puberty and then to adult. So we have five real time points here, which allows us to perform a time course analysis um, similar to the bulk RNA seq time course analysis. Um, alternatively, we can combine this strategy with single cell trajectory analysis uh, performed by other packages such as monocle or slingshot. And here I'm showing you um, some of the work done by my PhD student, Jimin Chen, and this is still an ongoing work. So here we first combine uh, all the single cell RNA seq samples across the five time points using the Seurat integration. And we can see on the UMAP plot of the integrated data that there is a cellular transition from basal to luminal progenitor and then to mature luminal cells. And on, uh, on the right, uh, this is the trajectory analysis result from slingshot. Um, the slingshot analysis assigned a pseudo time to each cell along the trajectory. And then we can construct pseudo bulb samples and assign uh, pseudo time to the pseudo bulb samples. And after that, we can perform a time course analysis as described previously. And here again, we use a spline curve um, to incorporate the pseudo time effect into the design and then proceed to the edge out downstream D analysis. And this allows us to, uh, to identify genes uh, that changes significantly along the trajectory. And here I'm showing you some of the top genes. Uh, the black dots are the observed values, whereas the red lines are the fitted expression curve along the pseudo time. So this allows us to interpret the trajectory analysis and to explore the expression pattern uh, for some genes of interest. All right, in summary, um, EGR is an old package, um, but it has always been a key component of bioconductor. Um, it leverages advanced uh, statistical methods from generalized linear model theory, uh, which makes it flexible to use and can be easily adapted to many applications, uh, including differential gene or transcript expression analysis, gene set enrichment, gene ontology, cat password analysis, differential exon usage analysis, time course analysis, as well as single cell pseudobody analysis. There are some other functionalities that I haven't mentioned here today. For example, uh, EGR can also be used for differential methylation analysis for bisulfide sequencing data. And, and EGR is also a cornerstone of some other popular bioconductor packages such as Seesaw for Chipsy ataxic analysis and DIFIC for high C analysis. Um, we've also made uh, EGR compatible with, uh, with a summarized experiment container used by other bioconductor packages. So, so I hope this overview talk uh, provides you a, a better understanding of the current state of the EGR package. And, and I hope you try out some of its feature in your own research projects and let us know if you have any feedback for future improvements. All right, with that, I would like to thank my supervisor, Gordon Smiles, um, who created and led the entire EDGAR project. Um, I feel so lucky to be able to join the EDGAR project and contribute to it. And also some of the work that I showed you today was done by Jimin Chen, uh, who is a very bright PhD, uh, PhD student uh, in our lab. Um, I would also like to thank many people who I closely work with over the last decade, um, especially Aaron Lung and Davis McCarthy who I worked with on the HR development during my PhD. And finally, I would like to thank my funding support from Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, MRFF, and NHMRC. Um, all right, before I finish up here, I just wanted to advertise a postdoc position and, um, and also a possible PhD opportunity in my lab next year. 
So, so I'll be setting up my own lab in the cancer division at Lehigh. And my lab will be focusing on the application of single cell omics and, and spatial technologies uh, to cancer research. So if you are interested, um, please feel free to get in touch. All right, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Yunshun. So we've got a question for you on the Slack that I'll read out for you. So uh, for Rebecca Johnston uh, asks, in the scenario when biologically the treatment condition causes a lot of transcriptional change and therefore a lot of differentially expressed genes, even after using GLM treat, does that violate any of EDGAR's assumptions? Um, let me think. Uh, well, uh, when you say a lot of different expressed genes, uh, what, what percentage are you talking about? Is that like over 50% or? or, or uh, I don't have that, but if uh, we can yeah. follow up on the Slack uh, and uh, Rebecca can provide perhaps a little more detail and uh, yeah. you can provide some Usually advice I there. Yeah, thanks. Usually, I wouldn't worry about that too much if it's um, if it's evenly uh, spread. Like for example, you have equal number of up and down genes, rather than eighty percent up and twenty percent down. Um, yeah, we can talk about that in more detail later. And uh, Matt Ritchie asks: In the trajectory analysis that you presented, do you create pseudo bulk of the single cell data and then fit the model, or is it fitted at the single cell level? Uh, at the moment, we do it at a pseudo bulk level, and uh, this is because we think pseudo bulk data uh, has more read counts and uh, will it fit better with the standard bulk RNA seq methods. Yeah. So but how do you pseudo bulk? Sorry. Sorry, Yunshin. How, how do you pseudo bulk over pseudo time? So what, like, what do you aggregate over? Uh, so or how do you group all, cells? Yeah. So first of all, we perform integration analysis. Uh, so we have, and, and then we define clusters on the integrated data. And then within each clusters, we might have cells from different samples. And that's how we get the pseudobot samples. And, and for the pseudo time, um, we just add, average the pseudo time for all the cells within each pseudobot sample and then assign to it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Yunshun. Uh, I've posted a link to your uh, postdoctoral job ad in the Slack. So if you're interested in applying, uh, please take a look. Uh, we'll have a couple minutes break and then our next talk uh, will begin uh, with Saror. So thank you again, uh, Yunchen. Thanks, Pete. Thank you.